We've had some great um, panels over the last couple of nights, um, but it struck me last night sitting there, I thought there's so many questions popping into my head that I'd like to pepper you with. Okay. Um, I've, got re- I've got to just remind you we've just had lunch. So that's I know. We're, we're all sort of... The blood flow has gone elsewhere. I can understand that. I'm feeling a bit the same, actually. But it's been a very refreshing weekend to have you here sharing with us. But while you're here, we're going to... Talk? We're going to talk, if, okay. if that's OK. Um, if you could tell us a little bit more about the, what was Lighthouse like when you first joined there as, as the lead pastor. Mm-hmm. You know, what was the situation, the numbers, the culture of the church? Sure. Uh, when I went to... Well, firstly, it wasn't called Lighthouse then. It was called Norman Park, uh, Norman Park Baptist Church. And my wife and I went to Norman Park. There was an elderly gentleman who was um, running the church then. Uh, it was quite a small congregation. I think we would sometimes on a Wednesday night for our Wednesday night Bible study, it would be the pastor and his wife and my wife and myself and a couple of our kids. That was pretty much our thing. Sunday morning crowd uh, was a very small crowd, mainly, mainly an elderly crowd. And uh, we had just our family. It was the young family. And there was another couple... Uh, two other couples who had some young kids and that was uh, pretty much our church from there. I went there with the intent of, um, in 1993, of really just uh, learning a little bit more under, a, under an older man and then thinking of going back to the Sunshine Coast where we came from and looking at starting a church back there on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, he ended up getting sick and got cancer after a couple of years when we were there and then the church... Um, he was going to he was going to resign. Then the church asked me if I'd take over as the pastor. To which I thought, I don't want to be here. This is not where I want to be. This is not this is not the area I'd like to sort of live. I want to get back to the coastal area where we where we grew up. We knew everybody. Uh, so we just um, we prayed about that, and we really sensed that that's where God wanted us to stay. So we were voted in, or I was voted in as the pastor with um, 23 members of our church. And that was in, uh, he, he finished up in the 96, I took over at 97. So this is, this has um, been there 20 years there now. Uh, the church was just a small little country Australian church. Uh, had one little building, probably, probably half the size of this building was our uh, original auditorium. And uh, I remember when we kicked off there in 97, I, I, I recognised I was... Um, I, was a, I felt my, I was a GP, a general practitioner as a pastor. I wasn't a specialist in any area at all. So I, I looked at a passage of scripture where it said, wisdom hath hewn out her seven pillars. And I said, God, what would be the seven pillars that I think a church needs? And at that point in time, we had no, no missions program in our church. We had no concept of soul winning or reaching the lost. It really wasn't part of that group. Uh, there was... Um, very limited uh, information on, and teaching on leadership or personal revival, on family itself. So I went through on, on worship and discipleship. They were the key seven areas. So I thought what I'd do is I searched around and tried to get in what I felt were a bit more specialist people in those areas. So I brought in a, a, a guy who'd been ministering here in Australia as a missionary for several years, and I brought him in to speak to our church on missions. And uh, I knew what they would do would take the wire because the, the wire was sort of way over here and I wanted to get in the middle. So I wanted someone who would give it us an extreme. So this guy was, you know, 150% missions. So he bent the wire way over here. So when he left, it sort of went, boom, sort of back to the centre. And I just brought in seven different guys who would teach our church on different areas. And during that period of time, um, I just kept working with our church and, and really emphasising an issue of discipleship. You've you talked about the areas Wednesday night. I think you actually mentioned you don't so much look at a church and see what needs to change, what needs improving. Is a good way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. Um, you've sort of mentioned the areas that you noticed needed improvement, and the people you brought. What about yourself? What did was there anything that you gained from others that or oh, from elsewhere? Look, every, every one of those uh, men that I brought in helped me, and because I would. One, one thing I would do as a younger pastor especially, uh, I would book appointments at times uh, if I was travelling somewhere with a senior pastor and 
I would have a list of questions that I wanted to ask. I actually, I remember one guy, I was, um, I was in the United States, quite a, quite a very influential man in the United States, and I uh, booked an appointment with him, and I went into his office, and I had a list of questions. I had some photos of our church, and as I would ask those questions, I'd be taking notes, and I'd be always asking, uh, what are some materials that have helped you? What's something that you've read in the last two years that has really helped you and influenced you? Uh, just a lot of questions I would have. Uh, and then at the end of it, I'd offer to pay them for their time because I've taken your time and I'd like to just, you know, can I pay you for your time? And invariably they'd say, don't, don't be stupid, oh, let's go out to lunch. And that, that meant I had more time with them and um, could speak with them more about different questions. So I learned a lot and I've, I've, I don't think anyone is a self-made individual. I really do believe that everybody is a product of the many influences in your life and that's really what I try to do is glean a lot from as many as I could. You mentioned discipleship was one of the main pillars, and I know you're very passionate about that. Can you share a few of the things you've done in your church or implemented, the leadership has implemented, to, to really emphasise discipleship and how it carries through? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, let me just read a verse of Scripture, because this was a verse that was uh, helpful for me in understanding a bit more about discipleship, and I want to emphasise a word in it. It says, "...and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses..." The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And the key word in that verse of scripture is the word able for me because I I felt if we are truly going to produce disciples and as I studied through the book of Acts, you'll find people were believers, 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 disciples. And then you'll find that they were added, 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 multiplied. So I could see something taking place in the development of people that they were no longer just a believer they actually have become a disciple, a, a committed one. Then you study what a disciple is, and especially the words of Jesus when he talks about what a disciple is, and it's a high cost. It's a high cost of discipleship. It's, and a disciple is a person who produces disciples, not just a believer. It can, can produce someone who can produce themselves. And the key, key word in that was that word able because I thought the responsibility that I have is I've heard some things among many witnesses. My job is to be able to commit those things to other people who shall be able to teach others also. And I had to look at, I don't just want to give people that information. I need to be able to reproduce what I am in somebody else so that they have the ability to teach the things that I've just taught them. Otherwise, I've found that some discipleship programs were just giving out people information, but they could never go and disciple anyone else themselves. So I had to be able to disciple a person and put something together that by the end of it, they would have the ability to be able to take that same truths and be able to impart that in somebody else. So the whole thing continued on from there. So that was a key part. And, and you developed some material yourself to, yeah, to, to go to that, yeah, yeah. to that end. Missions is, an, is another big aspect of your church um, can you share a little you've talked about how you brought someone in to speak specifically on that to sort of flick the, the switch to where it probably sure. more should be but how did you get from having you know 23 members to now being a church of is it found four five hundred yeah that now supports two missionaries maybe is it more than that yeah. what missionaries do you have and how do you see the transition from where you were to what you now have uh, there was uh, with that thought of the discipling, that all sort of goes hand in hand to me, because it was what I, what I did. I looked at the I looked at the first disciple that Jesus came in contact with, which was which was Andrew, and as he met Andrew, I just followed the life of Andrew in the Gospels, and Andrew learned how to play second fiddle, obviously, to his brother Peter, but Andrew was wasn't part of the inner three, but he was part of the inner four. But he was there through the progression of the life of Jesus and you'll find Andrew pop up. So I looked at the key moments in his life and I thought they are the things that we need to be able to develop in every, in every person's life. So we wrote our discipleship course or I wrote that course to match those key areas of life development. So rather than have a topical class, okay, discipleship, today we're going to learn about the local church or today we're going to learn about eternal security or today we're going to learn about that topic. I, I dispensed with that and I decided to follow how Jesus discipled Andrew in a development process and what he brought into his life at various stages. With that in mind, that's how we worked with anyone who was going to be sent out of our church. 
that, that we didn't just um, give them a bunch of information and say, okay, well now off you go. We really wanted to see that they were able to produce disciples and that they understood the process of discipleship through the life of Andrew. And that's what we did with, our, with the guys who we trained up. How, how our church went from different levels to that, uh, a lot of that had to do with, um, I, I really do think, with discipleship. Our discipleship program doesn't take six weeks to do. It takes about two years. And it's quite intensive. Uh, and it's more about, it's not about the content as it is about reproducing myself and the other person. For example, uh, when we teach people on the areas of prayer, uh, we don't just teach a lesson on prayer. Uh, we talk about prayer life. And so the discipler will meet with the disciplee and their discipleship lesson will often be, you know, can meet up with me this week and just watch me do a quiet time. And where I got that from was when Jesus finished praying in Luke chapter 11, the Bible says when, when, uh, when Jesus ceased praying, his disciples asked unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. So they were sitting there watching him and listening to him pray and listening to him talk to the Father. And then they said, would you teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples? So we saw that as a key fundamental aspect that we need to be able to impart. Uh, Don't just say, here's what you do in a quiet time. We do the quiet time with them and we work with them through every aspect of their life. But we want to make sure anyone who we send out understood that concept. And it's 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 a slow process, but we just saw our church... They just continue to add and, and grow and develop that along those lines. And I don't think there's any sort of one key thing. It was just a progression of all of that constantly. And we still continue to do that today. And as far as um, how, how do you get from someone who walks in the door to church to that level? As far as is there a different, mm-hmm. not a title we'd give them, but is there a, a category of people in your church that how you view a structure from the, not Mm -hmm. the bottom, but, you know, from the leadership down to those that are just walking in through the door? Sure. Uh, I I believe God's a God of systems. He's created our, everything in this world has systems. We have a, you know, a solar system. We have the evaporation system. We have the circulatory system in our body, the, the nervous system. God creates systems. Um, for those of you guys who work with computers, you understand you can throw whatever program you want into a computer, but if you don't have an operating system, it doesn't matter what program you throw in, it's not going to work. The system has to be in place, and the system is what's going to keep that whole thing working. Well, we, I looked at the church then and said, what are the, what are the systems that a church needs to have in place? So if we can have a system in place, you don't have to really worry about it. It just works itself. So we've created some systems that are, are more assimilation systems. There is people come into our church. There's a system that they sort of just flow through that takes them through the next step of wherever they are. And uh, again, we can then plug in programs that can match that system. So when someone comes into our church, uh, we, everybody knows the, the very first step that we want a person to come to in our church is the thing we, we call Discover the Lighthouse. And it's an opportunity for them, for me to come and talk to them, for them to get to meet key people in our church and to find out what their next step is from there. And we look at that and say every person needs at least three homes. Every person needs three homes in their life. They need to have a celestial home. That's obviously a heavenly home. They need to have a church home where they're going to be loved and love and serve and be served and give and give and be given to. And they need to have a Christian home. And so as I talk to the people who are coming, I say we want to help you form all those homes in your life. And maybe your next step today is you really want to find more about, you need to know more about a celestial home. Here is the system we have set up for you. And it's a program they run into, which is, there are many different programs. We've created our own called Explore Christianity. And uh, we we heavily push, everyone's got a step to take. And we just try to work out where people are on that and what's the next step for that person. And our discipleship program is part of that. So we really feed people into a discipleship program. And a big part of, like having that is probably having the church has to capture that whole vision as well. So how do you? I spent two years two years on a Wednesday night discipling the church, and basically what I was doing was producing disciples. Uh, so that's I realised uh, <laughs> there were some people in our church who'd been in our church for you know, many years and they they never really worked out where they were because and I took all those different terms that people came into a church and I, I classified them this way. 
that um, there's lost people and they will come into the church and generally I call them lookers. They're, they're looking and they're just sort of checking out what's going to happen. And so Jesus gave that invitation. His first invitation to Andrew was come and see. Just come and check it out. Come and see. So that was, if you tell someone come and see, they're looking. But then we really want that person to move from being a looker to someone who says, I'm going to actually sit and listen for a while. And uh, we want that person. So we, we then invite them to something that they can now feel like I can listen and get involved at that level. Uh, Jesus told us that we ought to pray that the Lord send forth laborers. Very few people will come in those doors unless they've come from another church that are a laborer. So I believe it's our responsibility as a church is to help them and equip them to become the answer to Jesus' prayer as a laborer. And that takes, to me, that takes discipleship. I, I can't find any other way to do that. Intentional discipleship, working yep. them through that. Yeah. Trying to formulate the next one in my mind because I didn't have it written down. Um, what's the, what would you say the demographic of your church is? If you've got four to 500 people that regularly yeah. attend... Are uh, they all locals, most of whom have no church background at all, that have um, come into the church and come to a knowledge of Christ? Or is it people from other churches that have been attracted to your church? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, I, would, I would think uh, just gauging on people that have, get baptised each year, uh, we, we roughly baptise anywhere between 20 to 40 people a year. Uh, that are converts so that would be that we know of that are work through that situation as adults and that would a lot of those people have come through again our system they've come through explore christianity they've come through uh, a discipleship program and they've understood that concept they've been born again and worked through that most of them well majority of them are all local people that have come through we have had people who've obviously moved from other churches uh, that happens everywhere uh, but there has been a lot more, um, you know, there's a lot of debate at times about why do people come to churches, how do they come to churches. And we've tried, as probably you, this church has done, we've tried a multitude of outreach methods. And I think they all have some merit to them. But the number one reason people come to our church is because they know somebody. They've been invited to come because they have a relationship with a friend or with a family member or that's the number one, probably 95% of the people who've come to our churches because they've been invited by a friend. So we really, we really put that out as a lot to uh, encourage people to invite those people in and they work with them from there. Uh, we just had a youth, our, our missions meeting and there were six people who got saved during that meeting but it was, and all those six people were young. It was um, three teenagers uh, that were in grade uh, 10, 10, 11, 12 actually. And then there were three young adults who trusted Christ. Two of those young adults were visiting from Brisbane at the time. And then the other one uh, was still in, he's still in our church. Well, as soon as he got saved, his mother, who hadn't been in church for donkey's years, turns up to church now. And so it's, I think that's what's happened in our church. One person, one person has sort of been a key that's opened up a floodgate of four or five others who've come in. And, and that's how it sort of worked from there. Just changing tack for a little while because, again, back to one of your original answers, one of the key things you identify was discipleship and worship. And obviously, you're very studied in the area of worship. You've written uh, Worship Wolves. And worship, music and styles is something you're, you're passionate about. But how, how can a church be intentional just generally in how it worships? So that, so that question how can a church be intentional in how it worships? Because it's not just about the music, is it? Uh. I don't think I don't believe it's just a music issue. I think it's a heart issue to start with, and I think any group has to look at who you're ministering to and who you're reaching. Uh, at our church, um, people have asked us, and I mentioned this on Wednesday night. People have asked us, "Are you a traditional church?" and we say, "No." Are you a contemporary church? and we say, "No." They say, well, "What are you?" And I say, "We're a misfit." Now we've got to wear. We're more. We try to be generational and. Uh, we had um, one of the young guys who uh, came through our Bible college and is now actually over there helping Jeremy, uh, Matt Meads. I'm not sure if you guys know Matt Meads. Uh, Matt's a, a fantastic young missionary. He was working with Jeremy for a little while now. Now he's gone out and him and Lydia have now moved over to the west side of Vanuatu. Jeremy does the Big Bay area and Matt and Lydia do the, the west side. That's a whole team approach. 
Well, Matt um, came through and he, he came through over a, a period of about four or five days at our church and came to a senior service at our church, which is um, uh, a different style of worship service. It's, uh, it's more uh, hymn-based only. It's very, very staid in that sense. Then he went to a children's ministry and saw quite a, a vibrant kids' ministry. Then he went to a young adult's acoustic service and then he came to a, a youth service, which was much more alive. And then he came to our general church service and saw it was just all to blend of all this. And he, he said, I can see if you took one aspect of your church by itself, you would call yourself traditional. Or if you took one aspect, you might say it was a contemporary service. Or if you look at everything you see, he said, I understand what you mean by saying generational now. So there's, we've, we just struck a style that we think connects to the people of Rockhampton. And and when I say connect, um, you can get used to anything. And we just looked at the key point of us is we one of our goals is we want to be able to communicate the gospel in a way that connects to the average Australian and especially the person who has no real church knowledge or anything uh, if people have grown up in church world they already have a uh, generally a preference as to what they what they like or what they can understand because they relate to that but uh, our goal has been especially to try to reach people in church in, who who really have no church background and um, let them walk into a church and not feel like there's any barriers that seem like it's a bit odd. Anything to do with the gospel, the gospel's going to be offensive. To call a person a sinner is offensive. And we just, we just believe that the, the only thing that really should offend a person is the gospel. There will be the offense of the cross. We understand that. You never apologize for that. But if there's anything else that we're doing that is unnecessarily offensive, we've just tried to remove that barrier that could be an unnecessary offense uh, but at the same time, we have things that we set up and say, this is who we are and this is how we run it. If there was a rebuttal to that, just to play the devil's advocate, what's the trap, though, of just being trendy for being trendy's sake? You know, change for change. Oh, for sure. We, we don't ever do change for the sake of change. We do change for the sake of improvement. Uh, change for the sake of change is novelty, and novelty wears off. So I think if a, if a church or anyone does things just to be cool or trendy or hip or whatever the word may be, it only appeals to a certain group of people. I think any change you do ought to have a purpose behind it. Uh, we don't do anything unless there is a purpose that we're achieving, that we're aiming for with that. Uh, this is what we're intending to see happen with this. Uh, one thing we do with all our ministries, we always look for the win. And uh, we ask people in all our ministries to define the win. And what I mean by the win is uh, our sound team, like our technical team at the back, they have a a list of things that they've come up with and said, this is a win. In other words, if we, when we all see this achieved, that we, we won on that Sunday. It's that thing that makes you want to come back next week and say, yes, let's do this again for God. Uh, for example, we don't look at the numbers that turn up. We, if we have a youth program and we run our youth program on a Wednesday night, we don't just say, oh, we had a win because we had 100 young people at our youth program or we had... 50 people at our youth program, we don't look at that as the win. What we look for a win in our young people's lives is that, that we've had two people who stepped up to now offer to serve in a ministry role. That's a win. We've seen them take another step in their Christian life. So when we're all on the same page of what a win is, then we can celebrate that win. Uh, for example, if, um, if you're, I don't know what football teams play uh, here, but if you are a... Crows. Crows. If you're, a, if you're a Crows supporter as opposed to a Port Adelaide supporter uh, along those lines, and if, and if there was someone like, I, I understand Aussie Rules, but if there was someone from Queensland who had no idea what Aussie Rules was about, uh, they could say, and the Crows you know, kicked 10 goals, 11, 11 behinds, and, and, the, um, and Port Adelaide kicked uh, you know, five goals and 20 behinds, well, we know that the Crows have won. Port Adelaide lost because you know the score. Yeah. But, <laughs> but somebody watching the game could say, oh, Port Adelaide won, they kicked, they kicked the ball through those posts more than the other team. They say, no, 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 but they didn't get the right... But in their mind, that was the win. Or, oh, oh, Port Adelaide won because they caught the ball more. Well, that's not what makes a win. And so until, a, until you can define what the win is, nobody knows what really to celebrate. So we took every ministry and said, what's the win for children's ministry? What's the win for youth ministry? What's the win for the worship ministry? What's the win for 
you know, in preaching. What is the, we went through all of those things and then we evaluate that as, a, as leadership and different teams, ministry teams to say, you know what, this is what we really look for a win. We believe this is what God wants us to achieve. That helps us define what we do. Yeah. Now you do have a very vibrant young adults ministry, youth ministry. Can you explain a little bit about what happens in that ministry? Because it seems... In both of them? Well, yeah, in both because it seems like you've not drawn in the crowd so much but you've managed to keep a certain generation in church and passionate about God and serving him. Sure. I mean, you've, you've spoken, I think we already know the answer, but you, you've got the intentionality about it. But is there anything else you can share about what the youth and young adults do? Uh, yeah, we, we teach less for more with our, with our youth and with our children's ministries and, and, and we build that. What I mean by that is there are certain things we don't even bother about teaching our, our young, our, our teens, uh, there are certain things that we do want our teens to know about. For example, we don't teach our children's ministry about David and Bathsheba. We don't talk about that, but we definitely talk about that with our teen ministry because we're moving into different areas. So we've looked at what are the areas that, of the scriptures that we want to get our children to grasp these principles. We have things we want our preschoolers to grasp. Uh, one key, we want them to understand love. We want them to understand God. There are certain things we've looked at. What areas need to be developed in that child's life so that's building, like what Alan said, you, you've got to have some foundation to build upon. And then we build upon and build upon and build upon so that by the time they're in their, in their teens, they're getting doctrine, they're getting different Bible stories, they're getting specific you know, things. It's all building through that. Uh, so that's from a biblical perspective. We have a program we try to teach through uh, not systematically, but generally an idea of what we want to get accomplished at different levels. Uh, then uh, how it, what it looks like, is that more of the question you're asking, what it looks like? Uh, our, our youth program, uh, we, well, I'll have to back up a little bit to explain that. Our whole church program runs on our, our mission, and everything is driven by the mission that we believe God's given our church, which matches the the letters of our church, LBC, Lighthouse Baptist Church, and we look at the Great Commission, we look at what God has constructed us to do to be conformed to the image of Christ and those areas. And we say that everything in, in our church resolve, revolves around Jesus. And so we want everyone to be loving Jesus, we want everyone to be becoming like Jesus, and we want everyone to see to be communicating Jesus. So therefore, I have no way of making that happen. I can't make a person love Jesus, I can't make a person become like Jesus, and I can't make a person communicate Jesus. So the only way we can do that is create some relevant environment that might be a little bit more conducive for the Holy Ghost to work and the Holy Spirit to work in those people's lives to accomplish those ta- those, that mission. So in every group, whether it be children's, teens, a- young adults or adults, we create environments that will help them love, become and communicate Jesus. In the, we call those environments uh, like a home. We, we create a home and we call it a foyer, a lounge room and a dining room. And so that's where we're moving through. And we call our foyer, uh, we have foyer environments for teens, for young adults and for uh, adults. We have them for children as well, but some of them more combined. The foyer environment is what we call for is our general greeting. It's our general front front area. Uh, if I came to your house, Luke, or well, let me say you came to my home, and uh, you and Rachel turn up at my home, the first place you come to is the front door and the foyer area. And what would I do at that front door and foyer area? We'd greet you, welcome you, and you sort of it's it's fairly formal from that area. And then the next place, if you stayed long enough, we'd invite you to come into our lounge room and in our lounge room we're going to sit around and we're going to get to know you a little bit more it's a little bit more informal uh, a little bit more friendly uh, but then if I stay if you stay longer we're probably going to say why don't you stay for dinner you're going to move into the kitchen table and we're going to be sitting around the table and that's where you really generally get to know a person sit around and have a meal with them and you really get to connect with them well we think those environments exist in the church and if they don't we create those environments our foyer environment is generally on a Sunday morning uh, and our youth program, we have environments where they come in. It's generally our, our general setting of everyone coming together for a service. You don't get to know someone looking at the back of their head. It just doesn't happen. What you guys did here today, you had a lounge, you had a foyer environment and you had a lounge room environment. You then had something where people could gather, get together and informally get together and chat and get to know a person a bit more. 
So we create those specifically as environments for different groups. We have them for teens, we have them for young adults, and then we really, really want everyone to get into a dining room environment. We call them our small groups, or whether it be a Sunday school class or whatever you want to call it, but a smaller group where you are with people, discussing things with people, provoking one another to be loving, becoming, and communicating Jesus. And our leaders are challenging people in those areas all the time on how we how are we commun- how are we becoming like Jesus in in learning about Him. Uh, loving people like he loved people, demonstrating the walk of Christ, and then we also look at how we're communicating him with our words and our works. So it's, we work that through every group. So the bigger environments are more for youth and young adults, a little bit different, but they're generally energetic environments and because um, and they've got a lot of energy, they wear me out. Uh, then they'll have uh, some lounge room environments which are more activity-based, and then they'll have their dining room environments, which are real Bible study prayer times and real intensive, intentional times to work on their lives as disciples. Um, Just a final one, and again, changing attack. If there was a young couple here today that are considering ministry and full-time ministry, they feel a call of the Lord, especially to pastoral ministry or missional work, what are you going to say to them? Or what wisdom from all your years of experience... Uh, would you would you say would be starting steps for them? Uh, starting steps, if they were going to, if they're a young couple, number one, I'd get around an experienced couple, and I would glean as much as I can from an experienced couple in ministry. Uh, number two, I wouldn't rush into anything because I think I, I already had four churches planted in my mind before I ever started, ever got involved in any of already, and I'm glad God never let me go and do that because I would have made a mess of it. I wasn't ready for it. I, wasn't, I wanted to learn more about... Uh, even the, the old gentleman who I was with before uh, I took over, uh, he, he taught me a lot. Um, he was a really... He was just a bush... A real bushy Aussie bloke. And um, we were, on, we were lift, literally, pardon the pun, poles apart educationally. Uh, he came from a total different frame educationally that I came from. But he taught me an immense amount of things on uh, how to deal with people at the real level, at, at base level, and I'm glad I had that experience with him. So I would be telling that couple, get around a good couple that can mentor you, can help you, be honest with you, and open yourself up to be wounded uh, and give permission to a couple to wound you uh, because you want faithful are the wounds of a friend and that way you want a person to be, you don't want them to be hold back, you want them to wound you because that's going to help you. That's how I would sort of work with and, and take my time. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. <laughs> We're just going to break for a couple of minutes while we reset things a, a little bit, but don't move in your seats. We'll be back in a moment. We'll sing a song and then Robert will be sharing. Good. Thank you.